those same forests that we, we use for our maple industry also support some of the highest number of nesting bird species. Well, my name is Steve Hagenboo. I'm a senior conservation biologist and forester with Audubon Vermont, which is part of the National Audubon Society, a conservation nonprofit really focused on protecting birds in the places they need today and tomorrow. Here in Vermont, of course, one of those important places is our forests. And um, today we're out in the, the forest of the Green Mountain Audubon Center in Huntington, Vermont. We're actually standing in our sugar bush. We do have a relatively small scale maple operation here at the Audubon Center. We do about five to 600 taps, depending on the year. The one thing that makes us unique at the Audubon Center is that we still do our sap collection the old fashioned way, using, using buckets. So we put out, again, 500 to 600 buckets every year that we collect with a, a tractor and a, and a cart, and a sap, sap tank on the cart. And then we bring that back to our sugar house, um, which has more of a traditional um, a, a feel to it. It, it has a, a liter evaporator in there, and we're wood fired today still. So, so we're still using that traditional fuel method for boiling that sap down. And we still see that steam uh, billowing out of our sugar house there every, every March and, and into April. Um, each year we make somewhere around 100 gallons of, of syrup off of our, off our five to 600 tap operation. So we're out in the sugar bush today in the, in the summer months, which many people may not think about, you know, being in what's, what's happening in a sugar bush during the summer months. Most people are familiar knowing that Vermont leads the country in maple syrup production every year, about 50% of the U.S. crop coming out of our state. What fewer people realize, however, is that those same forests that we, we use for our maple industry also support some of the highest number of nesting bird species during those same summer months. So uh, migratory birds in particular that spend the winter in Central America, South America, come back up here every year with one goal in mind, and that is to nest and raise the next generation of their species. So an awareness of, of understanding the importance of the forest to both our maple industry and to bird and bird conservation. Audubon Vermont uh, partnered up with the Vermont Maple Sugar Makers Association and the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation in 2014 to create a program to kind of bring these two important aspects of our forest together um, and create what we call the Bird Friendly Maple Program. The whole idea of Bird Friendly Maple is to get maple producers to become aware of the important role that their sugar bushes play in bird conservation, as well as help to get consumers of maple syrup to understand that when they're enjoying that maple syrup, there's, there's a lot more behind it. There's a story that's to be told there about some of the other ecosystem service benefits that come along with, with our maple industry. We wanted to create a program that would uh, kind of uh, promote maple producers to want to manage their sugar bush with birds in mind. And that involves kind of taking into consideration some things that, that aren't always considered when we're thinking about sugar bush management and, and sap production. And in recognition of those producers for managing for certain habitat characteristics in their sugar bushes, we actually give them some unique labeling and marketing opportunities to help tell the story of their participation in the program and help consumers to, to maybe say, hey, this is something I want to support. I can see that this maple producer is really thinking about uh, the long-term ecosystem um, benefits that include bird habitat when they're out there. So when a maple producer is interested in knowing what can I do in, in managing my sugar bush with birds in mind and perhaps uh, enroll in our bird friendly maple program and be able to label their products with our labeling and signage they might put at their sugar house, there's a couple key things that we want them to be thinking about. So obviously when we're thinking about maple production, one of the things we really wanna be having in our forest, of course, are maple trees, whether they're sugar maple and or red maple. But when we're thinking about being bird friendly and really supporting a diversity of bird species, we wanna be thinking about having more than maple in our sugar bush. And in fact, we have some, some guidance that helps us think about how much more than maple do we want. So typically we try to get people to think about um, having at least 25% of their sugar bush using common forestry measurements to be something other than sugar maple. So adding diversity to the forest, which will really help to increase the uh, diversity of birds that we're gonna find out here, as well as the total number of birds that we find in our forest. So having a monoculture won't support as many species or number of birds as something that has a more diverse composition to it. So in our forest here, most of the tall trees that we have in the, in the overstory in the canopy are the trees that we tap. So th many of those are maple trees, but what we see coming in underneath um, as kind of the next cohort of the forest, over here we see that we have uh, some additional species like Eastern Hemlock, 
uh, which is a softwood trees. And I know some folks don't like to have softwood trees in their sugar bush for a variety of reasons. We actually find that having softwood trees as a component of the woods allows us to bring in some bird species that otherwise may be absent. Birds that prefer softwoods like either a blue-headed vireo or a Blackburnian warbler. So thinking about maximizing the number of birds we can support really advocates for, for having that diversity of trees, including even some softwoods in, in certain parts of the forest. So back here, that, that eastern hemlock um, also creates something that we think of as being uh, structure in the forest. When we think about having um, a really good bird-friendly sugar bush, we don't want to just have a park-like sort of, of condition where we have big tall trees overhead and, and really nothing else. We want to have a variety of tree heights. We call that forest structure because birds don't just nest in the upper canopy of the forest. In fact, many bird species nest in many other places than, than in the canopy. So we're looking for trees that are about head height to, to 30 feet tall, uh, creating what we call the mid canopy or mid story of the forest. And we wanna make sure that through um, maybe perhaps some of the management we do in our sugar bush, we're helping to promote that growth uh, to come in here. And that's where we're gonna find birds like our wood thrush and our red-eyed vireo, um, really looking to put their nests in that height range. Below the mid-story, we get down to what a lot of this American beach is here, um, and that would be what's called the understory. So this is gonna be our woody plants, our trees and shrubs that are about from ground level up to about head height, five to six feet in height. And in there, we're gonna find birds like black-throated blue warbler, which really exclusively nest within that understory layer of the forest. So really, we think about the forest in these different layers, understory, midstory, and the canopy overhead, making sure we have places for birds to nest and to forage for insects. But also, this is helping our forest to be resilient uh, to the future and, and the, the, the way the, cli the, ch the climate is changing and affecting our forest. We wanna have um, a, a variety of things happening and not just one aspect of the forest in, in the canopy trees overhead. We also have some exciting things coming in down here low in our understory. We have the, the white ash and we also have some red oak. Red oak's a good one to think about. It's, it's predicted to do pretty well in the future with a warmed, warming climate. So knowing we have them now, um, even though this won't be an oak forest, perhaps for a very, very long time, even in our sugar bush, having some oak out there is also a desirable thing for helping to increase that, that diversity. So some of the things that we're asking our maple producers to think about that would really enhance the habitat value of their forests are what we see around us here right now. Off here to the side, we've got this uh, really large standing dead tree or what we call a snag. And snags are an important part of habitat for a lot of different bird species as well as other wildlife. In particular, we think about those birds that we call cavity nesters. Those are birds like um, our woodpecker species, both the residents that are here all year long, like the pileated woodpecker, and the migratory species like yellow-bellied sapsucker. So these standing dead trees provide an opportunity for those birds to excavate um, a hole into the tree where they can find a nesting place, a nest cavity, um, as well as look for insects that may be in those dead trees as well. So understanding that in a, in a sugar bush, that we may not wanna have a lot of standing dead trees out there for the, for the simple reason that those standing dead trees eventually will fall to the ground. Um, and when they do that, they may come down on our, on our tubing system if we have that. Um, so instead of following some of the, the main recommendations that we have for forestry and wildlife habitat, which would su suggest somewhere around six or more on average of these standing dead trees per, per acre, with the Bird Friendly Maple Program, we brought that back down to a little bit more manageable level. So we're asking people to think about retaining or recruiting um, uh, at least two snags per acre so that we have opportunities for those birds that are cavity nesters or that are gonna be foraging for insects on those trees to be able to find what they're looking for out here. Once those standing dead trees, however, fall to the ground, which they will always do, then we have what we see behind it over here, which is actually the top of this snag. And this is what we refer to as downed woody material, um, or coarse woody material in this case, because it's a, it's a pretty large log. And one of the real important bird habitat benefits to those logs actually um, factors in with um, one of our game species that we have in our forest, which is the uh, ruffed grouse. So ruffed grouse, uh, those, those downed logs on the forest floor are important places for that grouse, the male, to get up on there, and it'll do its drumming 
um, where it takes its wings and it slowly starts off and starts beating faster and faster where those wings beat against their sides and it creates this drumming sound. It's almost as if you heard one in the distance. It sounds like someone's trying to start a lawnmower, a pool lawnmower out in the distance. But that's in fact, most likely, a rough grouse out there doing its, its, um, its courtship display, which is, which is the drumming. There's also uh, a lot of benefit to what's underneath those logs, which would be things like spiders, insects, salamanders, all of which can be important food for a lot of the songbirds that are gonna be using, especially foraging on the forest floor, like our wood thrush or our oven bird. Over here, we have another piece of down woody material, but this one actually has the top still associated with it. And we would call this fine woody material. So when the, a tree falls in the forest, it retains those tops right there in the woods and that, that fine woody material provides important cover for songbirds to be able to get into and perhaps hide from a predator. There's also usually a lot of insects that are in there for those birds. And beyond that, having the tops left in the forest helps to, when we have young trees starting to, to grow back in the sugar bush, what we might call regeneration of, of young trees, uh, that those fine woody material piles help to protect that regeneration from deer brows um, that deer life love to come in and they love to eat small trees. So this really helps give those trees a leg up, give them the opportunity to, to grow up through there before the deer have a chance to get them. Well, the Bird Friendly Maple Program has been really well received by maple producers here in Vermont since its inception in 2014. Uh, as of 2023, we have 80 producers that are currently enrolled in the program and they are managing somewhere around 15,000 acres of maple sugar bush. So we have 15,000 acres of forest land that is intentionally being managed to consider the habitat needs of our songbirds that we're trying to, to conserve. Um, the interest in the program has also sped, uh, gone beyond the borders of Vermont. And currently my colleagues in New York State at Audubon, New York have um, created their own bird friendly maple program. Um, and this summer, in summer 2023, I'm also working with Maine Audubon, the Maine Maple Producers Association, and the University of Maine Extension to bring the program uh, to the Pine Tree State. Audubon, Connecticut, which is also part of Audubon, New York, um, is doing the program as well at this point. And we've heard some interest from Wisconsin, uh, from West Virginia, and Indiana. We've had a chance to talk a bit about the things that we are looking for in our bird-friendly sugar bush. One of the things that we are not looking for um, in our sugar bushes are the presence of invasive and non-native plants. Things like honeysuckle and Japanese barberry, uh, multiflora rose in some places, and buckthorn are all species that uh, in certain parts of the state have really come in and taken over uh, growing in the understory and provide a much lower quality habitat and food resource. Those berries that those plants produce will be eaten by birds um, but they don't provide the same nutritional quality as eating some of the berries of our native vegetation would. One of the points I always like to make um, when I'm talking to somebody about bird-friendly maple is that all maple sugar bushes are inherently good for birds. And that's because the most uh, critical threat to any of our bird populations is when the habitat is no longer there. So maple producers obviously want to keep a healthy forest resource and so just by, by uh, using those forests to produce maple syrup, we are keeping that forest as forest. And that's a great thing to make sure that we're thinking about our birds out there. From there, it's how we then manage and steward that sugar bush that can make it just either be an okay place for birds or a place that's uh, highly productive, allows them to nest successfully, get that next generation of their young off and migrate out of Vermont come fall.